Welcome to the Neophyte in the Woods podcast with Andrew McDowell. to another episode of Neophyte in the Woods. This is your host, Andrew McDowell. I hope everybody had a, a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, a Happy Hanukkah. Um, we're here with a, a a little bit of a, a change of pace episode for us. Obviously, deer season's over for for me, and uh, so we want to change change gears. Uh, so we're here talking with Stan of um, Catch and Creation. Uh, you can find him on YouTube talking about uh, snakes and... Uh, frogs and spiders and kind of all the the good wildlife that that uh that's out there uh stands down in north carolina uh, and you can see him on youtube talking about everything uh, i guess actually rapping uh about uh what is and isn't a copperhead uh to uh videos of uh bluebirds and uh reptiles uh that he that he's passionate about stan thank you uh very much for for joining me tonight yeah it's my pleasure i'm glad to be here tonight so catch and creation how did this all get started it's it's a kind of a a view a a a channel about your adventures in the outdoors and and connecting with and and embracing and enjoying reptiles but it's more than that yeah um catching creation i guess started back in 2010 uh but i've been filming uh animal videos and wildlife videos for probably going on 15 years now, the early 2000s, like 02, 03, I started filming uh, actually spoof videos, kind of like mockumentaries about the crocodile hunter, uh, truthfully. (laughs) And uh, I would put on a mullet wig and we would, you know, a really bad Australian accent. We'd go out and catch stuff. And it kind of morphed into a bunch of different uh, things over the years. Um, I was a soldier in the North Carolina Army National Guard. We deployed to Iraq. And uh, while there, I linked up with a good buddy named Daniel. And he and I began to film, even before Daniel, I just started filming with a lot of guys when I was deployed, made these videos. Uh, I got the call sign Critter Gator while I was deployed. And, uh, you know, partially because I stopped the convoy one time to catch a lizard. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I did, did stuff like that. We, we were making these videos there. And then when we got home, uh, my buddy Daniel and I kept filming uh Stuff here under a bunch of different names, ranging from the Idiot Chronicles to Firefight Films and a bunch of other stuff. And we kind of landed on Catching Creation because it seemed more all-encompassing. Um, and I guess when the name, when I started doing it as Catching Creation, I actually was in college for the second degree path. Mm-hmm. Uh, started in environmental biology, went to war after you know three and a half years in that program and decided to come back and pursue uh theology which is okay most polar opposite <laughs> um so i can say that catching creation was kind of birthed in a church just thought hey it kind of wraps everything up and i could talk about you know if i wanted to talk about faith stuff mm-hmm. or talk about just kind of any slew of things it was kind of a broad enough umbrella to where it um allowed me to do stuff but primarily we do reptiles and amphibians um i've spent the last as catching creation in the last seven years, pretty actively filming, you know, relatively consistent episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, man, I'm just super passionate about the outdoors and super passionate about wildlife in general and conservation. And, uh, one name or another, I'll continue doing this until I can't do this anymore. Absolutely. So if it's, if it's catching creation, that's cool. And that's what it probably will be from now on. But, uh, 
again, I have a, a, <laughs> a track record of just doing it and rebranding it and moving forward because I'm just so passionate about this stuff that I want to get the message out there to whoever I can and whoever will listen. And and were you this interested in, in kind of herpetology, I guess you could say, when you were a kid or, or is this a, an adult onset uh, passion? Oh, no, man. This is like uh, – Ever since as long as I can remember, my mom would take us to the creek and we'd flip rocks and look for salamanders, um, you know, stuff like that. I feel like the woods were my first babysitter. So, you know, we would get dropped off at this grandparent or step grandparent's house and my brother and sister and I would just go explore the woods and we'd catch box turtles. We'd bring toads home. We'd catch fence lizards. You know, we just always yeah. had little terrariums of something uh, growing up. That's that's awesome. And, you know, you you're did you grow up in North Carolina or are you a, a transplant? No, I did. I grew up in North Carolina. Uh, I grew up in a place called Trinity, North Carolina, uh -huh. which is, if you're from there, you just say you're from High Point because it's the next biggest yep. town, which is also small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I grew I grew up in the middle of North Carolina, so equidistant from the mountains and the ocean, That's and cool. uh, you know, got to play around in the woods a lot. We have a lot of biodiversity here, mm -hmm. and just it's amazing, kind of the animals you can find here. Yeah, and you know, I I think you you have a a great place for it. Growing up, I. I was a suburban kid, like through and through my, my, my babysitter was the TV, um, <laughs> you know, but you know, going back a generation, my uncle actually was kind of, you know, how, how you grew up. And my mom tells stories about coming home from school one day and, and there was like a string over the, the sink and she went to move it cause she wanted to wash her hands. And it was a, a garter snake that scared the living heck out of her. <laughs> yeah uh, we've definitely got stories like that of snakes getting loose in the house and finding them months later or never finding them and yeah. uh that's even carried on to my adult life <laughs> <laughs> you know and there's something to be said for for enjoying larger game at times or you know larger species i don't have to worry about a deer getting lost in my house it's it's gonna stick out pretty good if it somehow uh jumps off the back of my truck oh for sure yeah <laughs> So, you know, one of the things that, that come in and we wanted to talk about is is conservation. And obviously, I think that snakes in particular get a bad rap. Um, you know, I gave the example when we were emailing. Uh, I don't know, you know, how, how widely this is known, but there are rattlesnakes up here in Massachusetts. Um, and they were extirpated from uh, one of the, – there's a series of islands in one of our reservoirs. Uh, and the State Department of Fish and Game or Wildlife wanted to reintroduce them as a means of, you know, returning a species to the wild and, and, and bringing it back. But also um, there was a really serious uh, uh, mouse and rat problem on the island. It was it was actually ending up affecting the uh, the quality of the water that was coming out of of the reservoir. And. I swear to God, it was almost a, a second whiskey rebellion. I mean, they they came really close to blows at a couple of public meetings. I thought that people were gonna, you know, cut the tires of the trucks going in when they were they were trying to reintroduce them. And I think it was not founded in any science. This, these people's fear. It was more, well, snakes are scary and rattlesnakes are poisonous, so I don't want them in my backyard. And that's terrifying on a lot of levels. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, it goes to certainly what, what seems to be one of your, your focuses is, is, is eliminating fear from, from ignorance, for, for lack of a better um, term. You know, can you, can you talk a little bit about that, how, how that came about and, and why, you gotta, why you've kind of built some of your brand in talking about that? You know, the, yeah. I, I, I point to the, um, I mentioned the, the Copperhead rap at the top your, your top video on the site is this is a copperhead this isn't a copperhead there's no need to kill them because they're actually helping you out it's basically the, the gist of the song if i'm i'm doing it justice absolutely yeah we you know we made that copperhead song um uh, i think two years ago you know it was like the the second <laughs> the second rap song we made uh, we're all i don't know if you can tell from my voice but we're all extremely caucasian um <laughs> You know, most of us grew up playing in punk rock or hardcore bands if yep. we had any musical background. And so hip hop was just kind of a funny progression. But uh, I'm, a lot of what I do is conservation through entertainment. Um, you know, I want people to obviously I don't expect everyone to be as passionate about them as, as I am. But, you know, if you'll take a pause and not kill something because of something we've we've shown you or a video you've seen, 
because you've realized, hey, maybe I don't have to kill this thing. I think that that's conservation 101. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's it's showing that, hey, a lot of the reasons why you want to kill this is this innate fear that you have, you know, pre-programmed in you, whether it's our evolutionary history or or even if you go from a biblical perspective that people have, a, you know, they're pretty salty about snakes ever since the first mm -hmm. of the Bible. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just, I believe that if you can show them, hey, that it's not this evil animal, this evil thing, um, it definitely shifts the focus and people begin to think at least. I mean, I, one of my biggest encouragements is, you know, people will send me pictures of snakes before they kill them, you know, not, and, and then they ultimately usually won't kill them uh, because they've taken that second pause to kind of look and say, actually, that's not a copperhead or actually that's not, you know, even harmful, even if it is a copperhead. Uh, you know, and that's one of the most common venomous snakes that we have in North Carolina is the copperhead um, for those of you that aren't in the, the Southeast. But uh, in general, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a proponent obviously for killing any snake, um, mm -hmm. But I understand the reality that people are, and if you feel threatened, of course, like if it's between you and your kids, I get it. I, I truly, I, tr I truly do. Um, but if you can take a second and say, "Hey, that's actually not going to hurt me if I just keep a wide berth and walk around it," so the, you know, the songs that we make and the and the stuff like that, it's just one more tool in our toolbox that helps us to get that message out that. Um, you know, that the snakes are good, that these animals aren't bad and, uh, and they have a purpose and a value. I think that's the biggest message that I want to get out is that whether you agree or disagree with them living and breathing, uh, they actually have a really good intrinsic value, both intrinsically, I mean, both ecologically and, uh, as well as medically and a bunch of other, you know, reasons that we should keep these guys around. So let's actually run down that path a little bit. You know, you mentioned, they haven't. I mean, obviously, they have intrinsic value. They're living. They're living things. They have a certain amount of of right and agency, you know, in and of themselves. But let's let's talk about some of the the values that are maybe a little bit deeper to the to the average person. You know, you you mentioned that there's there's medical value to them. Could you yeah. expound on yeah. that a little bit? Absolutely. They they use copperhead. I mean, specifically copperheads, but you know, a lot of venomous snakes in general. Um, they'll use compounds from their venom for different medications. Uh, I know with with Copperhead specifically, at one time they were working on a serum for breast cancer that would um, – they created a serum called Contortrostatin, which the scientific name of a Copperhead is a kisser on Contortrix uh, for the nerds out there. And uh, <laughs> so, so they made a made a serum out of that, and, and it was showing positive results. You know, I haven't read any recent reports on it, but from the last time I read about it, it would essentially encap encapsulate the cancer cells, and uh, it would help kind of flush them out of the body. So it was showing promise, and then there are other things. I believe, uh, you know, certain rattlesnakes they use their their venom to help treat uh, stroke patients hmm. and heart heart attack patients. Uh, the venoms of you know other snakes used for like kind of something similar to morphine uh, for pain relief. So there's a lot of value and benefit medically from these guys. Not to mention their ecological value in the sense of, you know, like you were talking about earlier about keeping the, the mouse and rat population at bay, which in turn helps us prevent diseases like Lyme disease, mm -hmm. um, where ticks and fleas, you know, are carried on the mice and rats. The snakes kind of keep control of that, um, you know, along with possums and other animals too. But they help kind of keep these numbers of, of disease-ridden animals down that ultimately help us as people um, kind of keep that balance, so to speak. Yeah, and you know that that Lyme disease thing is is a pretty big one. Obviously, you know, up here in the Northeast and, and across a lot of the country, Lyme disease has become a a big issue for folks who who like spending time outdoors. You know that I have a um, she'll be six months old next week. the 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 moment in my life that scared me the most. I mean, granted, it's it's only been six months with this kid, so I'm sure she's got other frights in me but you know there was a i came back out of the woods one day and i was sitting down and snuggling her and i, I looked down and there's a deer tick crawling across her chest right and like your first thought is an oh it's a bug it's oh my god she's gonna get lyme disease right i mean it it's and people don't make the connection between you know some of these wild animals that people kill out of ham possums are definitely one of them and higher instances of lyme disease or you know vermin control um, you know, I think that that's a, that's a shame. You know, I, I, I definitely never made the connection until later on. And, and with, you know, tonight, you know, I, I never really, before tonight, I re never really made the connection between snake venom and, you know, beating breast cancer. And I think that that's something that, that people lose when they're, when they're losing the forest for the trees with, 
you know, just I just want it gone because it's in my way or I just want it gone because it scares me. That can get expanded out, I think. And, and you know, tell me if you agree to some of the issues that are that are facing, you know, the, the larger natural world. Right. So we have a major push right now to clear cut or, you know, extract minerals from not only our public lands, but the Amazon you know, jungle in Costa Rica, where's a lot of these same, not necessarily species, but there, there's the same opportunity for the next cure, the next great, you know, medical breakthrough to come through, come from, and, and we're, we're clear cutting it, or we're growing cattle where we should, where we used to have rainforests. You know, I, I think it's, it's all connected for, if we want to embrace the hippie. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I just, I think it's, it's interesting. It's, it's sad on the one hand because, I mean, you know, the rainforest is, you know, produces a lot of oxygen and kind of is a filter for, for the world. And there's so much medical value mm-hmm. in plants and animals and the stuff that we've yet to discover out there. It's easy for me as a comfortable American to say don't develop, you know, when there's the in, like extreme poverty in some areas of Costa Rica where these people are just trying to make a living and feed their own families. Um, you know what I mean? So it's... It, it's like a very mixed bag, I believe. Like, of course, I don't want to see the rainforest mm-hmm. get destroyed, but I feel like there's a better way. Like, I feel like there's a way where we can kind of systematically serve one another and, mm-hmm. and conserve these environments or, or use responsible conservation, uh, whether it's not out and out preservation, you know, perhaps yep. there's a, a sustainable way to do it through responsible conservation where we can do land management that's you know, that's correct. It's not just for the bottom dollar. It's for the environment and the next generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, I think that there's a way that that can be profitable if the people are ethical. Yeah. And I don't think anybody's looking for the Fern Gully solution. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> but, but the, the middle way, right. I, I think that you're exactly right when, when you, you know, we can have use, but it doesn't have to be, you know, gutting it and burning it down. You know, I mean, I, there's a, there's a good example. I mean, locally, you know, like the the national forest, a lot of them are based on land leases. Um, so every so often, they'll timber a portion of the national forest, which, you know, the, I don't know where the money goes, if it goes back into conservation or if it goes into whoever leased the land. But they're not clear cutting whole swaths of the forest. It's just small sections, you know, every 30 years or so. And in that meantime, you know, there are definitely old growth areas, uh, at least in the one that I'm that I'm familiar with. And it's it's seemingly sustainable because you're not just, you know, you're not displacing entire populations. Mm-hmm. You may displace a tiny population of something that could easily move, you know, uh, like a quarter acre down, you know, down the way or whatever. Um, it's not always the case. Obviously, there are places that have higher value and higher population density of things. And all of that should be taken into consideration before before doing any of this stuff. But again, I think that there is a responsible way to do it. I'm just not sure. I don't know the answer to be perfectly honest mm-hmm. with you. I really don't. <laughs> and, and you know what, if you did, I think we'd be both be, well, I know you'd certainly be pretty rich. I'd probably squander it on, you know, <laughs> seeds and hunting leases or something. But, um, yeah. you know, I, I think that that's, that's the, that's the crux of this whole thing, right? There's a, a middle road and we just haven't figured it out yet. And that's, you know, terrifying. You know, I, I think about, you know, my kid and then her kids and then her kids. Like, at the end of the day, I want her to have the opportunity to go and see a sage grouse out in the West, right? But at the same time, I'd like her to be able to go down and visit her parents in South Carolina and see a copperhead, you know, or, or you know, see a snake or see, a, you know, lizards that we don't have up here. You know, my wife gets super jazzed when we go down and visit her family in, in South Carolina and, and they're like a Nolis running around and she just gets absolutely like first fish first whatever like excited to see and um you know it, that's great and it's sweet and that's the type of thing that you know we want to preserve but you know like you said people got to make a living too this this ain't free yeah absolutely um i yeah i, just, I don't even know what to say that because it's you know on the one hand we're, we're so we're so uh stuck on petroleum you know what i mean oil and all that so that's the whole fight you know it's like well, let's not develop for oil out west or don't develop on our own soil, but we're fighting a 17-year war that has yeah. a lot, you know, a lot to mm-hmm. do with 
the oil in the, in, in the Middle East, you know, and it's like, if I had to choose, do I want to destroy their environment or ours? I mean, selfishly, I'll say theirs because yep. it's really already destroyed anyway. Um, in a lot, in a lot of places, <laughs> but, but truthfully, that shouldn't even be the argument. The argument yep. should be realistically, how can we develop new energy and put that money instead of an oil exploration, put that money in research to find green solutions to these problems versus just continually beating this dead horse because at some point these reserves are going to dry up and then what? It's going to be mm-hmm. too late. Yeah, and I think that you know that's where people like I think Elon Musk and and some of the the other you know brains out there who are who are looking for the next thing, you know they're they're looking for it. I don't think it's it's altruistic, right? I mean they want to make a buck. Elon Musk is looking to you know make as much money as he can off of Tesla, but at the same time, you know. I don't really care if he's trying to make as much money as possible as long as it helps solve the problem. It's the right. same thing with, with SpaceX, right? I mean, he's he's launching rockets so that he can charge people billions of dollars to get cargo up to the ISS and into low Earth orbit and then to Mars, right? But that the technology is going to help in the long run, you know, help with medical advances, help with technological advances. It's going to build a better mousetrap. I think if people aren't worried about, you know, how they're going to breathe or how they're going to eat or how they're going to these things, they can think further into the future about, um, you know, creating these solutions or, or, or once these things are kind of proven out, you know, we're not so dependent, you know, then, uh, yeah, there will be more, I guess, time to fix these other issues too. Mm-hmm. It's all, yeah. Like you said, it all goes hand in hand, you know, with, with one another. Yeah. I think it's, it's, there's, it's, you know, to use the natural term, it's symbiotic, right? I mean, I think that, you can't have one without the other, and, and having both makes it impossible for everybody else to, to get along. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, – going back to the petroleum thing, you know, I, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, you know, the argument about climate change and global warming and all that, you know, I don't want to weigh in necessarily mm-hmm. on that completely. But, I mean, you can look environmentally, you know, like I said, whether it's man-made or natural or who knows. Like, I mean, it seems like it's leaning towards we're contributing to it, but – you know, there are issues with, with bats having white nose syndrome. Mm-hmm. It's like a fungus and it's a lot is related to um, you know, things being warmer over winter and these fungus is allowing themselves to, to grow in them in the southeast. Um, the same thing is happening kind of parallel with, with snake fungal disease. And there are several other things that are happening that are all because uh the chytrid fungus or chytrid, however you want to pronounce mm-hmm. it, with the frogs uh now in America, but you know, historically it's been in Central and South America and uh you know, all these issues are directly related to the microscopic raising of the temperature. You know, people scoff at, well, what's one degree, what's two degrees? But, you know, in, in the life of a reptile and especially in the life mm-hmm. of an amphibian that's so uh, determined by micro degrees. I mean, it's it's like just from my own like minuscule experience raising uh, tropical frogs. I mean, if, mm-hmm. if it gets five degrees too warm or, you know, 10 percent drier than it should be they drop dead and they're that sensitive. Uh, but the rainforest, you know, historically is designed to house them and live, you know, mm-hmm. for them to live. But when we're clear cutting it for whether it's meat production or oil exploration or palm, palm oil, you know, farms or whatever, um, all these things are contributing to their decline um, of all these keystone species, all these, these animals that play a vital role in each environment. And it's easy for me to talk about that and, you know, and say, well, boycott this or do that. Mm-hmm. But realistically, I, I'm as much part of the problem as as you are, as everyone is. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to fix this, you know, short term to make a long term solution. I really don't. Other than being responsible with what you purchase and and, and, and how much uh, you waste as far as uh, plastics and different mm-hmm. things, because genuinely all that stuff definitely contributes to this bigger picture but it doesn't seem like it when it's on your own personal world until you look at it kind of big picture and see how much garbage we're all producing or how mm-hmm. much our culture of materialism has created this kind of monstrosity for landfills. I mean, it's it's kind of a nightmare if you actually step outside of it and look at what it really looks like. But <laughs> it's easy just to be comfortable and, and numb too, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's, that's the thing is, is people people think, well – I'm just one person. I'm not going to make a difference. So they, you know, they go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a, a coffee and a, a styrofoam cup. And then they go to McDonald's. I mean, McDonald's doesn't do styrofoam wrappers anymore. But, you know, they go to McDonald's and they get their, you know, their burger. But, you know, between the two of them, they're driving a, you know, an H3 that 
you know, gets five miles to the gallon and, you know, contributing to the problem. It's, it's not, you know, yeah, one individual is not going to make the difference between the earth getting warmer by a degree or not. But if everybody, you know, cut their consumption by 10%, you know, you, you got to think that it would, it would pretty quickly make a difference. And if they, if they, you know, instead of, you know, patronizing, I don't know, Smexon Mobile, I don't know, some some company that's, you know, causing issues out there, strip mining the width and breadth of, of you know, the jungle looking for oil. Um, Exxon Mobile, please, for the love of all that is good. I'm not actually saying you do that. Please, 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 please don't sue me. Um, you know, I think that if, if, like you said, if folks just paid attention, I think it, it it would make a difference. You know, the United States is big country. We're 300 plus million people. We don't agree on everything, but we all want something better for our kids and our kids' kids. So, you know, if we can, you know, just take half a step in the right direction, I think it's going to make a difference. I think it's, it's some, it's simple things, you know, it's, it's limiting how many, you know, plastic things you're purchasing. You know, if you can, if you can buy one container for your water versus buying, you know, every week, those 24 packs of water. I mean, just that simply makes a difference of mm-hmm. how much plastic is being produced and, and then cons- and then how much we're consuming. Um, if you are cognizant, you know, and this is something that I, I'd like to do more and I'm not doing right now as much, but if you're cognizant of how much palm oil or things that are used palm oil, you know, if you can use things that, if you have a choice between one that is produced with palm oil and one that isn't, um, you know, go with the one that's not because mm-hmm. those are creating what they're calling green deserts. So it's, they're displacing huge swaths of rainforest in the countries where they're planting these palm uh, fields to grow the, the things for palm oil. And, and uh, it's basically displacing all the wildlife that lives there. And ultimately, yeah, it's still green. It's still plants. But the thing is, is the things aren't the same anymore. Mm-hmm. They're no longer able to survive in these little niche habitats that where they, that, where they exist. So it's just simple things where it's, if you can reuse something, reuse it. You know, remember Captain Planet, recycle, reuse, <laughs> use. I mean, like that mantra plays in my head all the time. Uh, <laughs> as cheesy as it is, yeah, like Fern Gully and Captain Planet were two staples for me growing up, I guess. <laughs> so I, I got to ask the Captain Planet question. Which one of the Planeteers were you? Uh, I'm that uh, with fire because I get super angry. So <laughs> <laughs> I just go straight rage mode. Uh, I, I would assume that would probably be more in line with me, I guess. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, you, you don't seem like Mati to me or, you know, whatever the, the heart guy was. Yeah, no, that's not me. I mean, I have a lot of heart and passion, yep. but uh, it burns pretty hot. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one of those shows that I I just couldn't appreciate for whatever reason. Now, looking back on it, it's like a slice of my childhood, but I think I can count on, on one hand the number of times I watched a full episode. I just got frustrated. I mean, the kids just seem dumb. Like, they, yeah. just, they just seem dumb. I just expected more from my, from my Planeteers, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we've we've spent about about half an hour talking about conservation. We could definitely, you know, spend days on it. One of the other things I want to talk about, you know, watching some videos, you know, over the past, you know, couple of weeks, um, you you've done some traveling. You know, not everything you do is in North Carolina. You know, what what kind of made you want to look beyond your backyard, right? But also, you know, do you have favorite stories or, or favorite kind of experiences there um that you you know you want to share with us sure yeah i mean i i I grew up just fascinated by wildlife documentaries and watching kind of stuff Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from around the world um and so any any opportunity i get to travel you know i want to do that and i want to film in new places and i forgot to turn off the sound on my emails sorry for the pings um but yeah, like I, you know, I, went, I got to go to Costa Rica in I think 2013, and I, you know, I've wanted to go to Costa Rica since I was in sixth grade. I mean, just from the first time I realized it was a place, I was in love with it. Um, I've devoted like I tattooed my whole left arm with Costa Rican wildlife uh, oh, before I ever went there, you know, and I just always been fascinated with it, you know, ever since I, like I said, sixth grade, the strawberry poison dart frogs, the the pamelio dart frogs, and then the golden toads just kind of drew me in like the, and then seeing like images in uh, my science textbooks in elementary and middle school about, uh, you know, the golden toad being extinct and not being seen since 1989 and and stuff like that. It was just one of those things where, um, I don't know, it made me really sad, but it also made me think, you know, maybe there's something I can do about this or something 
maybe I need to explore some of these places before other things are gone. Um, so Costa Rica for me was great. You know, I got to find uh, red eye tree frogs, which are amazing. We got to go to kind of it was it was a zoo, but it kind of wasn't a zoo. It was basically just walls where they had stuff inside. So mm-hmm. I got to see a lot of the frogs I wanted to see were in there, um, and just we got to travel the country and see. It was on, I was on a mission trip with, with uh, mm-hmm. I went to documentary for a church uh, that a friend of mine went to, and uh, you know so they let me come with them if I filmed them. And then while I was there in our downtime, me and my buddy Chance went out and caught tarantulas and frogs. And uh, I think we only found one snake, a vine snake. Um, and then when I was in Iraq, uh, you know, I found some amazing animals. I mean, everything from hedgehogs uh, down in Kuwait to, um, we caught one in Kuwait, we caught one in Mosul. Uh, you know, I, I call every kind of gecko that we could find. Uh, mm-hmm. There was one video we posted where we were catching fan footed geckos under, we went, stupidly under the wire at the base TQ and, and, uh, I think Northwestern Iraq, uh, Takadam air base. And it was during kind of all the stuff that was going on in Ramadi mm-hmm. just close by. And we crawled under the wire and we're exploring these blown out houses. We, we had too much downtime. We were a bunch of, yep. uh, E4 specialists that probably should have had more oversight. Um, <laughs> but I found fan footed geckos out there or in, you know, in, in Kuwait and Southern Iraq, I found Euromastix lizards, uh, which were amazing mm-hmm. um, and Arabian limbless lizards and stuff like that. I mean, uh, and then down in Florida, you know, any number of things that are invasive down there. We've, we found all kinds of things, everything from basilisk lizards and iguanas mm-hmm. to cane toads and wow. man, you name it. Like, like I said, if I get an opportunity, I, I just want to travel yeah. uh, and go see stuff. And hopefully there's some stuff coming up in the future. Um, in the next year or so, I want to get more serious about filming. Mm-hmm. We've been filming these things for years. There's 200 and some videos yep. on the YouTube channel, and uh, I'd like to start making them a little more artistic. I mean, our, our channel kind of ranges from the, the, the stupid songs that we do to little clips from my backyard to full-blown episodes, mm-hmm. um, like we film in, a, a lot in the North Carolina Sandhills. So, uh, can, can I ask you to tell the um, stopping the convoy to pick up a uh... – was it a lizard in Iraq? Can I ask you to tell that story? Yeah, it was one of those things. Like um, when I filmed the documentary, uh, I guess a year and a half, two years ago, called Hammer Down mm-hmm. about my tour in Iraq. And truthfully, like everyone kept telling me that I did this story. I, I personally, I vaguely, vaguely remember it because it does. It's not out of the norm for me. Um, so everyone kept telling me that I did it, and it was in southern, like it was in the Udari Range. So it was on the Kuwait kind of side on the Kuwait. Uh, it's in the, the desert of Kuwait um, or so, – yeah. And uh, we were training there doing convoy operations. And I don't even remember what it was. I remember seeing like – if it was a Euromastix or something, I remember just running out and trying to catch something. But the story is very foggy to me. But the guys <laughs> – like I had three different guys come up to me that I hadn't talked to in years. And I'm like, you remember that time you did this? I'm like, I guess I, <laughs> I, guess I did. Um uh, but it's again, it's like we've I've spent a lifetime doing things just like that. So it's, sometimes those memories kind of merge together. All runs together, sure. Um, but yeah, That's that right. was just a great experience. I mean, you know, set the war aside for a second. Mm-hmm. It was one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been, as far as environmentally. I mean, the most beautiful sunrises, sunsets, some amazing bird species. Um, and all kinds of, you know, lizards and geckos, just desert wildlife in general. I've never been to a desert before I went to Kuwait and Iraq. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I really am anticipating going and visiting our, you know, native, uh, Western desert in in the U S at some point, hopefully this summer. That would be great. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's one of those, you know, everybody says, uh, you know, the Arizona desert is beautiful and yeah, it is, but there's more to it than, you know, red mesas and, you know, and, and Pueblos. I mean, there's, there's tremendous, you know, you wouldn't think in a desert that there's, you know, anything but cactuses and, 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 you know, heel monsters, but there's a lot more there than I think a lot, a lot of people credit. And, um, I think that that's why there's, at least in the Northeast, you know, indifference towards, um, you know, the, the Western public lands, you know, that's an issue that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, and I guess you could say angry about right now, obviously, you know, the, the president 
reduce the size of a lot of the Western, you know, national monuments by a lot, you know, by, by huge amounts, you know, going back on a, a promise that I, I feel like he and, and his, his secretary of the interior had made, you know, during the campaign, you know, whether you voted for him or not. And, um, you know, I think that the reason that they can get away with stuff like that is because people in the Northeast and, and, you know, the Midwest don't access it, so they don't pay attention to it. So, you know, and let's, let's call a spade a spade here. You know, that's where the majority of the population lives in the, on the East coast or on the West coast. And, you know, I, I think that that's terrifying, right? That, that, that something so big that belongs to all of us could get taken over and sold off to the highest bidder, you know, with, without an act of Congress, with a, a stroke of a pen, with, with no due diligence. I think that that's what's going on in a lot of, a lot of places where it's, you know, up here, we can't call it corruption because he had the legal power to do it. But at the same time, you know, South America, Middle East, Russia, you know, there's, there's out and out corruption that makes it hard to, to preserve our public spaces. Yeah. And in this particular issue, you know, I've, truthfully remain a little bit ignorant about it i mean i've looked at it from a couple different angles um and i'm not intelligent enough to weigh in on it obviously i'm not a proponent of uh taking away wild lands um you know for for things like that but i mean truthfully i i don't know enough about it to to make like a concerted statement other than saying i'm not sure about this particular incident but i do know that it's a slippery slope you know it's whether this is right wrong or indifferent um, depending on who you ask, it, it, it becomes a slippery slope when we shrink this national park, we shrink, you know, shrink another one, then we start shrinking state parks. Mm-hmm. And in a lot of states, those are the only areas that are wild. You know, those yep. are the only areas that are theoretically untouched. And that becomes a scary proposition because, uh, I mean, there are a lot of, for example, right around here, that you know, there are timber rattlesnakes on a couple of the state parks near me. And if there weren't state parks there, those timber rattlesnakes wouldn't exist, I do believe, because mm-hmm. truthfully, they would be where I live in my own backyard, you know, if if uh, if it would have been preserved like the, like the state parks would have been. But since the state parks, you know, aren't open to exploration or aren't open to, um, you know, clear cutting and all that, these animals have been able to establish themselves, whereas the areas where I live are historically farmland where people have clear cut for decades and, and generations and, you know, even centuries. And it's, uh, all the animals have been extirpated from these areas and gone to those kind of more isolated areas. And if we start getting rid of those, it's, again, it's a domino effect. You know, those guys are going to be next. And that's just one example of one animal species in one area. Um, and that's a pretty big one. So I know that there are other things, you know, we're not looking at on a micro level that, Mm -hmm. And even the areas out west, you know, the historic areas, the uh, the natural heritage places of the Native Americans and things like that, that may be affected by some of this stuff is, it's egregious. Because if we get rid of our cultural history, you know, much less our environmental history, it's it's just a shame to see that stuff go to the wayside. Yeah, and I think that the the, the key phrase in, in what you just said was slippery slope. I mean, it, it's people use that phrase all the time, but in this case, it's 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 literally true. You know, they're going to reduce the size of a national monument by X percent, and then they're going to realize that they got away with it, so they're going to do it again and again and again until there's nothing left. You know, I, I don't think that we're ever going to run out of blacktop, right? I mean, that's that's here to stay. We're, we're never going to go in a direction where there's not going to be highways and roads, but we can run out of wildlands really quickly. And, it, you know, it can happen in maybe not my lifetime, but certainly in the next, you know, my daughter's or or her, you know, her one day future offspring. I think that, and that's something that, that people not, need to not lose sight of. Yeah, you know, I mean, a hundred years is nothing in, in the scope of an environment as far as it progressing naturally. But if you look at it the way we've kind of mm-hmm. destroyed things over the last hundred years, we've made exponential change to the environment. And some of that stuff can't be reversed. You know, some of yeah. that stuff can't be repaired. I mean, you look at some of the animals, like there's a species of, I guess you would consider it a salamander, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but it's called an axolotl. And yep. you know, right now they only exist in basically the pet trade because the mm-hmm. areas they're from in Mexico City became so polluted they can no longer harbor these animals. Or you, you have animals like the hellbender salamander, which is the the biggest species in the in the U.S. and they're in the Appalachian Mountains and mm-hmm. 
um, you know, those areas of North Carolina. I think they go down to um, uh, I can't the I can't remember the name of the um, the other park down in Arkansas, but um, mm-hmm. the Ozarks. But anyway, they, they rely on you know clean moving streams, and because of siltation and other things like that, based on industry and you know erosion and things like that, those guys are even starting to die. So we're making a drastic impact on the environment around us, and a lot of these guys, and I think that's why I fell in love with frogs specifically. They're, mm-hmm. They become environmental indicators. You know, it's, yeah. you start seeing these guys die off, or you start seeing these guys maybe not breed as readily, or you stop hearing the crickets at night. You stop mm-hmm. hearing all these other things and you start to take notice, Hey, I'm not hearing as many Robins as I see here in the spring or, you know, whatever it may be. It's we're making an impact on them for sure. Yep. And once, I mean, once they're gone, they're gone. I mean, you, you can't unring that bell. No. I mean, one of the things like you were talking about in the very beginning about, you know, people getting kind of salty and upset about, you know, releasing rattlesnakes up there in hopes to restore natural population. Mm-hmm. You know, a very similar thing happened in North Carolina, and it's it's debatable on both sides. But with the um, well, there's two things with with the red wolf, I believe, uh, in the far eastern part of the state. You know, they released them and tried to reestablish them out there from their historic range. But then the scientific you know scientists were debating whether they're even a, a succinct species or not. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, the people began to you know to quote fewer for their lives and were killing the wolves when that's how we got rid of them in the first place because people out yeah. there were killing them now granted some situations may have warranted it I, I don't know but it's just again one microcosm in north carolina you know because of habitat loss and and eradication you know the eastern diamondback rattlesnake has become uh pretty rare in our state and it's just it's a similar situation you know, nobody wants to re uh redistribute those guys in the wild but people will click on a video of a dying polar bear and, and think, oh, that's that's super sad. Mm-hmm. Polar bear, well, these animals are both in the same kind of situation, you know. One of them is cute and cuddly and the other one is is scaly. And the thing is, is the one that's cute and cuddly is going to get the fanfare and the yeah. other one's going to go by the wayside, unfortunately. Yeah, it's it's the, the charismatic megafauna, you mm-hmm. know, thing. People care about pa- pandas. They don't care about axolotls, right? I mean, right. and... And I don't know if that's like a a human thing, right? I mean, do we care more about the cute thing because we're humans or do we care more about the cute thing because that's what society tells us to care about, right? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think that an axolotl is going to sell as many t-shirts for the World Wildlife Fund as, as a, as a panda will. And I think we can personify mammals a lot easier Mm -hmm. because mammals, you know what I mean? So it's, there's at some very basic level, like there's some relation that we have to them because they care for their young and they seem nurturing, even though it's over personification of these animals or anthropomorphization or whatever. Um, but it's somehow easier because we have pet dogs and we have other things that mm-hmm. we feel like are emotionally attached to us that it's easier for us to kind of have these attribute these same values to these animals when at the end of the day, uh, in, in some cases, even like the snakes may play a, a more vital role. And I'm just using yep. snakes as a blanket yeah. example, but you know, they may play a more vital role in their micro habitat than, you know, a deer or a panda bear ever could. Yep. Uh, but the thing is, is, you know, again, if it's got fur, it's going to get fanfare. Mm-hmm. That's a good tagline. There it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think that these are, you know, bigger issues. And I think that, you know, I, I really wish that there was, a, you know, a, an easy solution. But I, I think it's it's something that we need to examine as as a society and as a as a planet. You know, what matters. You know, it's easy to get rich, relatively speaking, but it's not easy to get rich and and necessarily protect. You know, vulnerable populations. And you know, you you were talking about, you know, frogs being a pretty good indicator species of of you know habitats and i think that a lot of people don't realize that you know they think oh it's a frog you know there's there's a thousand bullfrogs in the lake around the corner what does it matter if if one species goes away and i think that that's again it's missing the forest for the trees not every species is going to be a bullfrog which are relatively i would assume you know of of amphibians a relatively hardy species you know on in the scheme of things right yeah, you would you would think, and 
you know, the thing is, is yeah, one frog may not make a difference, mm -hmm. but that one frog is part of a complex food web that sustains everything in the woods. You know what I mean? From the, from the level of bugs that are affecting the deer on down to the snakes that eat them, to the hawks and the birds of prey that eat the snakes and, you know, so on and so forth kind of down the line. And, and if one kind of piece of this puzzle is gone, things start to collapse. And when the environment collapses, what you're seeing now in a lot of cases with the bees, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when the environment starts to collapse, things start to die and things stop working. So if one organism, like we'll use bees as an example, begins to die off because of colony collapse disorder or whatever, um, then – plants aren't being pollinated and when plants aren't being pollinated they're not producing and then we're not getting the food that we would get from them and then we're suffering so it's you know we're not as far removed from the environment as we think we are mm -hmm. yeah actually you know on the the colony collapse thing i i lost track of that pretty quick did did they figure out what's causing it or is it still one of those those mysteries the last, and i i read a handful of books on it and it, it's all old news i'm sure but um I think the last that I read about it was it's very strong, like pesticides was part of it, mm -hmm. um, like pesticides and overuse of pesticides and uh, herbicides and things like that. And then also kind of the overuse of the bees. So the a lot of the corporate uh, pollinators, so to speak, these guys would take, you know, tractor trailer loads of bees from uh, Florida to California and, and everywhere in between. And the bees weren't getting much of a break. So that was okay. part of it. But I think that the consensus was um, like some of them were varroa mites, uh, but a lot of it was pesticides that were creating these, uh, I guess, conflicts in the in the makeup of the bee where they couldn't find their way back basically um, to the to the colony and then they would just die. Uh, but there's, again, a lot of there's a lot of issues. It's a very complex thing. And mm -hmm. who knows? Like I. I would need to read further about it, but the last I read it was pesticides was definitely a suspect for sure. And I, I can only imagine trucking a, a colony of bees from one coast to another is not really going to be conducive to their long-term health. No, I got a bee in my truck one time, and it was a terrifying ride home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, yeah. I'm, I'm fortunate enough not to be A, allergic, but B, be particularly scared of them. But I know some people who it's it's just the end of the world if there's a a bee in their car or in their house. Oh, that would yeah, that would that would be no fun. No. I yeah, fun experiences in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, you know, and that's another question. You know, my wife is absolutely terrified, like petrified, of spiders, and I can't figure out a gentle way of breaking her of it and it's just not going to happen you know we're in her 30s she's going to be spider scared of spiders forever but finding an alternative the, of her just smashing them with a newspaper and you know she she'll go around the house and kill every spider she sees and then wonder why there are you know mosquitoes all over the place and it, you know that's a, a very real example i think of of folks not making the connection between human action and a real impact on the the natural world right yeah i mean in that regard i mean i fell in love with spider i worked in a lab that studied bats randomly enough and my first job in that research lab uh, when i was in college was to classify the bugs uh that they had trapped and a lot mm -hmm. of them were spiders and they were you know they were dead um but i started learning about them and the more i learned about them and i think this is kind of the key with me with everything like you know i was I appreciated spiders. I was kind of scared of them for a long time. And then the more I learned about them, the more I really enjoyed them and the more I, I started to even like them. And even in some cases, like, uh, you know, like little crab spiders and stuff, they almost look cute, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of it is exposure. You know, it's, it's, it's seeing something in a different light. You know, I'm sure you've seen those videos that pop up on Facebook of like the, the little spider, the jumping spider with like the mariachi, uh, yeah. things. And, you know, as goofy as something like that is, you know, that changes people's opinions of animals. It changes people's opinions of, uh, of certain snakes because, or certain, certain, uh, things like spiders, uh, simply because it shows them in a different light because we've been bred or, or, you know, whatever to believe this is evil, this is bad. And it goes back to pre, you know, uh, pre-dawn humanity or whatever, 
of course we have to have this innate fear of snakes. We have to have this innate fear of spiders and, and bugs and whatever, because our life very well could have depended on it in our evolutionary history back in the day. Um, but now I think if you can change that perspective and see it in a new light, I think a lot of people, they may not ever want to reach out and touch or cuddle mm-hmm. one, but I think that just, again, showing it in a different light helps um, change that opinion. Whether, you know, you may not, like I said, want to hold it, but you might scoot it out of the house with a broom now instead. Yep. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm ever going to win that battle with my wife. Well, I'm still, yeah, I'm there too, so... <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least I know I'm not alone in that. Yeah, like we had stink bugs. I don't know if you guys have those yep. up there, but yep. it, they've been a pretty invasive thing. And, you know, instead of kind of my wife for a year or two would get real mad because they're everywhere. And they, we never had like a ton of them, but I would just name them. It's like, oh, there's Percy again, you know. <laughs> and uh, and they kind of demystified it a little bit. and It wasn't as big of a deal. Yeah, it's it's funny. Percy is, is one of the deer that I've been looking for for the past couple of years. And my wife is horrified that I named it, <laughs> but you know, it, he'll still taste good when I catch up with him. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. We had a traumatic, <laughs> traumatic experience with a deer, uh, probably a, six, eight weeks ago in my backyard, a baby deer got into the, my backyard and my dogs and the neighbor's dog corralled it to the oh. fence. And it, uh, it jumped and I guess, killed itself oh, on no. the fence post and uh i was out of town camping with a veterans group that i yep. that I camp with and uh came home to that so <laughs> it was uh not a good situation how how long was it hanging there before you uh you extra extricated it for... well my my neighbor was kind of johnny on the spot and it, okay it, it yeah they they took it and someone processed it okay um, i was gonna ask yeah so it was, a, it was a baby so i mean i'm, I'm assuming they still ate it but yeah that's what you know, veal comes from somewhere too. Yeah, that was the thought that I had. Um, but I mean, that again, everything cycles back to conservation. Yep. You know, with deer, you know, people get so. I don't personally hunt. There's nothing. Mm-hmm. I have nothing against it, um, and I, I look forward to potentially doing it next year. But uh, yeah. uh, there's something to be said about it because we've systematically culled the natural predators of deer. Mm-hmm. Uh, things like this happen. You know, they people hit them with their cars because they're overpopulated. Yep. And yep. when they're overpopulated, they're diseased, they starve, yes. they, it's a much worse fate for them yep. than basically naturally selecting them as the top predator in the environment by hunters like yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like we up here outside of Boston, there's, a, there's an enormous state park called the Blue Hills. And for 60 years, there was no hunting allowed, like zero hunting, no bow hunting, no trapping, no nothing. And the deer herd, like a healthy deer herd is like, three deer per square mile i don't know something like that there were like 18 deer per square mile up there they were starving to death they were getting they were just riddled with ticks and and were had every you know dearborn disease under the sun and and people were okay with that because they weren't getting killed by people except for the hundreds of them that got hit by cars every year and then the state reintroduced a controlled hunt up there to try to lower the numbers and again, I mean, people were lining up and um, protesting. There were signs. There were all these emotional arguments. Um, fortunately, up here in Massachusetts, there are pretty strong anti-hunter harassment laws. So a couple of the folks went through with, with symbols and they got arrested pretty quick. But like it's 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 again, you know, like we started talking about it's it's emotion based and there's no no logic or science behind the protest well, now i'm not yeah. gonna i'm not gonna sit here and tell you that that hunting is the only solution for overpopulation but it's certainly one that that science has borne out as 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 being useful and 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 productive i mean and when it's done ethically it's it's yep. more sustainable um you know and it's better for the environment in the in the long run for meat production you know yep. if, if you look at the bigger ills of what's creating a lot of the problems in the rainforest for example it's you know it's it's large meat producers that are clear cutting the forest Mm -hmm. to put lasers like cattle out there um to supply the demand that's here you know whereas if each person would you know get a couple deer in their freezer it would offset the number of cattle that we needed and we may be able to just keep it in house in america versus going Mm -hmm. overseas or or wherever you know it, it becomes more sustainable and more environmentally friendly um 
and if it, it, it jumps on the whole, you know, it's green, it's organic, it's blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. I mean, it, it, it truly is probably much better for you and much better yeah. for the environment to yep. ethically cull, you know, deer. And with hunter's licenses um, and fishing license and things like that, you know, I know that that promotes more conservation. That yep. money goes directly to conservation. Yes. So hunters and fishermen are realistically putting their money where their mouth is, um, more so than a lot of the loud mouths that are out there mm-hmm. protesting you. You know yep. what I mean? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that that's another one of those things that people just don't don't understand. You know, I bought a, a new black powder rifle last year, and there's an excise tax that the that goes on top of that, you know, say the gun was 200 bucks 10 percent of that goes directly to conservation and when you like you said when you when you take that out across every single hunter and fisherman in the country you know we're talking billions with a b of dollars going into conservation whereas i'm sure that our friends at friends of the blue hill deer aren't putting thousands of dollars into conservation let alone millions or billions right and on that note, if it's okay, mm-hmm. like, yeah. you know, there are some great organizations um, that are promoting conservation. Uh, I know specifically down in Georgia, for example, there's an organization called the Orient Society that is doing great things for Sandhills, you know, habitat and uh, indigo mm-hmm. snakes and gopher tortoise, eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, and just habitat conservation. Um, like, I believe really strongly in that organization. I mean, they're there are a lot of people doing great things right now. So not to disparage, you know, all the ills of the world, but there yeah. are definitely people doing great things for the environment, for the ecosystem. Um, you know, people like yourself that are kind of putting out a, a positive narrative on a lot of this stuff, which is great. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. I think that's how we enact change. It's, it's being yeah. a mouthpiece, um, you know, for the change we want to see and, and then backing it up with action. Absolutely. You know, and I think you need to include yourself in that too. You know, I, you know, clicking through here, I, I, you know, I don't have a ton of interaction with, with snakes or, or, you know, some of these other creatures, but, you know, I, I definitely have a, a different view on them, you know, from, from watching these videos and, and kind of the, the internal monologue that, that they provoked in me. Um, so, you know, thank you for, for doing that and, and putting out the, the content. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we, we've been talking for about an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. I know it's coming up on dinner and, and, you know, you've got, you've got a life outside of talking to me about conservation. Um, you know, before we wind down, do you have any, anything you want to plug or, or any, um, you know, parting message messages for the, uh, the listeners out there? Um, yeah, I just think, you know, conservation starts where you are. And if you could change one mind, you can change a lot more. Um, that sounds cheesy, but I mean, that's kind of been my mantra is just, it's, it's not worrying about, and I think that's, it circles back a little bit to the, I understand I need to be more educated on some of these bigger issues, but I can't directly impact those. So I'm going to try to make a positive change on the, you know, the people I can directly touch, Mm -hmm. right. The three foot circle, so to speak. And maybe that's too short sighted, but I feel like if you can change one, they can change one. Um, and it's a much more organic way to make change. Um, other than that, you know, check out the website, catchingcreation.com. You know, we've we've got some a couple T-shirts that nobody's going to understand. And uh, <laughs> uh, we've got a new song coming out. You know, I'll send you an email with a link yeah. to it if you want to check it right. out. But yep, it's, uh, absolutely. It should be on iTunes any day now. Um, uh, and if you want to look us up, we're at Catching Creation on iTunes. I've got two songs live on there now and one song that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, right. I just got an email about the artwork. I got to fix it. But other than that, it should be live by the end of the week. Awesome. Um, it's about turtle conservation. So we should have a music video for that. Hopefully this spring, it's going to be nuts. <laughs> oh, great. I'm looking forward to it. I'll put a link to all that stuff in the, um, okay. the show notes for this episode. So put, people have a, uh, a one-stop shop as it were to, uh, to get to that other than the website. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Stan, thank you very much for, for taking some time on a, on a, Monday afternoon in December uh, to to sit down and and talk. No problem. It's been my pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I killed a cop a hand the other day. Man, that thing stood straight up and chased me into the garage.
tail, no. Green tail, no. Diamond head, no. That ain't no copper head, man. Them rows. Out of the corner of my eyes I see something slithering and looking at me Is it bad? Is it mean? Is that a copperhead staring at me? Little head and skinny One snake, too many Oh no, Stanley, no Let that little snake get grow Oh no, Stanley, no Let that little snake get grow Snakes are great and snakes are good We want snakes in our neighborhood The only good snake is a live snake Seriously, that's not a copperhead. That's a decays brown snake. They're completely harmless. They eat worms. Seriously, worms.